proposal update for two topics, aperon spectroscopy and strange meson spectroscopy. Then I will speak about the care facility beam line and hardware, which contains electron beam, compact photon source, beryllium target, flux monitor, KL beam, and liquid hydrogen and deuterium targets. And then I summarize. So hadron spectroscopy, <laughs> since the revolution which happened last century, we have made a lot of progress, but a lot of things remains to be done. So for example, here I show the four panels for hyperons, lambda, sigma, cascade, and omega hyperons. And uh, currently in PDG, we have, I, I have written on each panel, next to each panel, how many states are well established, how many states are three, uh, three stars, and you can see each panel has many more states than, than are known. So essentially, uh, the entire hyperon spectroscopy is in principle in infancy, because it is not, we don't know all of them. So not only constituent quark model predicts those many states, but also recent lattice QCD also predicts many more states, even more states than the quark model. So to show you uh, the current state of the art for the measurements, you can see the data which have been collected until now, existing data with red, and in blue we show how well can we measure if we get 100 days of uh, running for on the proton target. On the left side, there's a total cross-section. On the second panel, we see the sigma d omega differential cross-section for K plus cascade zero reaction at fixed W. And polarizations are uh, essentially absent. For hyper resonances, we need to do casting experiments on both proton and neutron targets. And we need to measure differential cross sections, polarization of strange hyperons, and then perform partial wave analysis. Then look at for poles in complex energy plane. So we can identify excited hyperons with mass up to 2,400 MeV in a formation and production reaction. Now this word formation is very important because essentially what we are proposing the Kernstrahlung beam, which means all energies of the beam will be available at once. So you don't have to change the momentum of the beam a thousand times. So essentially with the steps of one or two MeV at some range of masses, we can scan it and uh, make a formation of uh, sigma stars and if we use neutron target, then lambda stars. The measurements on a neutron target will be for the first time. So to give you some flavor about what quality of data we can obtain, on the next slide I show simulations for 20 and 100 days demonstrate PWA sensitivity to obtain results close to the simulated one. So here is a <clears throat> a bone gachina PWA, which was performed for current proposal. So you can see uh, with 20 days uh, uncertainty in green, in 100 days yellow band shows uh, the uh, accuracy or, or precision which will be obtained in 100 days. What does it mean? Uh, so it, here is a, the same thing for differential cross-sections and polarization. So for example, if you simulate sigma 1920, 5 half minus, 
in 100 days you will get back exactly the same number uh, and with a width of 0.32 in 20 days it will be off and the width will be not so accurate the lattice QCD for the same mass uh, is not uh, conclusive uh, depending on the input parameters different numbers are coming out for this state broad range of solutions so we need to measure it now i move to k pi scattering which is second half of of our talk uh, here are many reactions which can be done with kl beam because kl beam has a strange and anti state simultaneously so we can do k plus pi minus final state k minus pi plus k long pi zero k long pi plus and so on so in total nine states uh, nine reactions on a proton and nine reactions on a, on a neutron target so we have chosen three reactions simulated uh, k plus pi minus which was also reported on the uh, PAC 47 in this update there was a lot of discussions about how well can we go to the low T in order to be close to the pion pole uh, to require to fulfill the requirement of the elastic scattering of K on uh, pion scattering so we I'm moving on to show you film diagrams which we have simulated. The first reaction is, is KLP going to K plus pi minus. The pi zero has uh, more possibilities of other reactions to contribute, and we were advised to look at the charge exchange. So we have chosen uh, pi minus, uh, scattering K long on pi minus with. K minus pi zero, delta plus plus, and K long on proton pi minus, when final state is K long pi minus and delta plus plus. These are very important reactions because they allow us to make a uh, either spin one half and three half separation. To show you the previous data, <clears throat> this is slag data, K minus pi plus. And you can see uh, below 0.8 uh, GV, there is no data. Uh, Bell has measured tau decay to k pi nu tau. And they don't have data below some domain in the range of uh, kappa, which I'm going to talk about. Uh, then on the right side, you see k pi simulated uh, 100 days of running. Uh, we can measure many, many points below 0.8 Jeff, which is important. So one of the topics which uh, we have chosen is uh, now it's called K star 700 or uh, name changed in PDG. So, but PDG still considers that it needs further confirmation. And so, our experiment will measure all of these states and it's important because we have a possibility to check whether these states will be can be treated as a, a four quark states or a scalar mesonite in principle has to be established it's open question yet so if i look on the uh, Jaffe consideration uh, here is a mass uh, versus uh, isospin on the right side you see ordinary meson states qq bar and on the left you see a uh, diquark model for uh, scalar mesons which have inverted mass hierarchy you can see uh, in the case of uh, ordinary mesons qq bar phi is, is uh, on the top on the the apex and uh, sigma on the left is a, is on the bottom so clearly uh, the, this uh, spectroscopy of these states must 
hierarchy is very different for these two states, for these two uh, nonets. So invariant mass resolution was one of the questions which we were asked by uh, by our referees and by our readers. So here we show the uh, invariant mass resolution for all three reactions, k plus pi minus, k minus pi zero, and k log pi minus. All of them are below 1%, so we can bin uh, phase shift in, a, in a steps of 10 MeV or less. Now we show you uh, on a PAC 47, uh, Pelias and Rodas have uh, have done one second. Something happened to my screen. Hello. Just Hello? try to share. Go ahead and pull the talk back up. What shall I do? I should start again, probably. One moment. You see it now? Yes. Hello? Yes. Okay. So the, on, on, we presented this picture on uh, PAC 47. So our expected data were just scaled by expected statistics. <clears throat> we were uh, advised to make a simulation and instead of scaling down by, by statistics, phase shift and amplitude, Simulate it and show it how they look like. So we did it. <clears throat> this is uh, uh, these are data for uh, isospin three half S wave, and you see the old data from three GV up to fourteen point three GV. Uh, so projected statistics for for the case when we detect proton in final state red points. And when we don't detect a proton, um, the black points, the slack data are in the blue triangles. So distribution of four momentum of T prime in the reaction of KLP going to uh, K minus pi zero delta plus plus. Uh, here we plot T minus T minimum, which is T prime. And here is a phase shift simulation for one half and three half for S wave. On the right side, you see uh, isospin one half B wave. So the systematics uh, on, on the plot on the left panels for isospin one half and three half, we Estimated 5% of systematics, which is coming essentially from the flux monitor. Uh, let's say with some pessimistic estimation, uh, we believe that we can lower that uh, number. Uh, but the analysis for the kappa was done with our data here. And you see on the right panel, uh, the uh, red point will be expected uh, errors from, from our measurement. So if you compare uh, current state of the art for the kappa, on the lowest line is the um, KLF expected errors, which uh, essentially means we lower the um, uncertainty by factor of two for both for the position and for the width. So if we summarize K-pi scattering, we can say that KLF will have a very significant impact on our knowledge of K-pi scattering amplitudes. 
Uh, KLF will help resolve conflicting results for heavy case start parameter. KLF will help settle discrepancies in the scattering plans determined uh, phenomenologically from data versus Kyle perturbation theory and, and lattice QCD. KLF will improve precision of the mass and width of case star. KLF will help to clarify long-standing problem of existence or non-existence of scatter noise. I should add here that k pi scattering is, uh, mm, has attracted a lot of attention, not only because of the uh, case pattern by itself, but also because of the charmless decay of B mesons, because of the decay of uh, omega, uh, sorry, um, and because of the decay of open charm. Again, my, my screen disappeared. Sorry. You see my screen now? Yes. Hello? Yes. Okay. So, the k scattering, which is a part of the proposal, has attracted a broad audience of physicists from different fields. And there are also connections, which uh, I didn't include in my slide, but it's in the proposal, the measurement of uh, BUS, uh, uh, CK matrix element. So let me go to the whole D-beam line and the setup. So here we have Electron beam, 12 GV, 5 microampere, which is a very intensive beam. I should uh, remind you what Stuart was talking yesterday that not everybody realizes that CBAF is extremely high intensity beam. So this is a revolution which will happen in a spectroscopy. So we have uh, 12 GF, 5 microampere, Eating 10% of radiation length uh, target, and we produce uh, photons. Uh, we, this device is called compact photon source. And then the gamma beam hits the beryllium target. And then beryllium target on beryllium target we produce uh, we produce beam of K long, which then is transported to uh, to GLUEX uh, setup to the, to the target, to liquid hydrogen and deuterium target. You have four minutes left, Moskov. Five minutes, okay. Electron beam parameters are here 12 GV and 5 microampere, but it will not be continuous beam, but it will be 64 nanosecond bunch spacing. And according to experts uh, of accelerator, this uh, request can be fulfilled. Compact photon source has been uh, studied not only by us, but also by whole ANC. And conceptual design report has been um, made and paper is published in a NIM. So beryllium target assembly conceptual design is, is done and we post it in archive. The flux monitor is another important device which will measure decay of the K-long one flight. So here is a beautiful picture of a constructed KLF with flux monitor. The measurement of statistical errors of less than percent estimated conservative systematic errors of 5%. So here is a KLB beam flux. So the shape of the distributions of neutrons and kaons in our case and in the case of slack are very similar we, we have very big advantage we have 10 to 3 times 1000 times more statistics so cryogenic target has to be uh, modified and uh, experts uh, uh, do not see any big problems here diameter will be increased from 2 cm to 6 cm to have a larger solid angle to uh, accept more flux of KL beam on the target. So we were also advised to make a timeline of design, construction, and installation. So here is a slide which shows that in two, three years, we can be ready to run. 
And one important point I should mention that it's not irreversible. It can be switched back to the photon beam and conservative estimation shows that in six months one can switch back to photon beam if needed. So to make a physics program uh, solid and understandable, we organized four workshops and international workshop with 220 Two participants and 103 talks were given. Here is a map of our uh, co uh, collaborators from 68 universities from 19 countries. In summary, uh, proposed KL facility has a unique capability to improve existing world database up to three orders of magnitude. In high front spectroscopy, we will perform PWA and to unravel and measure pole positions and widths of dozens of new excited hyperon states. It's not measurement of one or two or three particles. It will be many, many, we, we cannot say exactly how many, but definitely dozens of new states will be uh, unraveled. In strange meson, meson spectroscopy, uh, we will measure uh, excited K star states, which will include also K star 700. And we need 100 days per, per each target, liquid hydrogen, liquid deuterium. All components of K-long facility considered are feasible. And the total cost, our estimation shows it may be below 5 million US dollars. So this is all that I wanted to tell you. Thank you very much. I'm ready for to take questions. Thank you very much, Moskov. So um, I uh, hand over the word to Stefan Paul, who's the first reader of this proposal. Please, Stefan. Yeah, thank you very much, Moskov, for this um, clear presentation and also clarification of a couple of issues. Um, I have some physics questions. Namely, um, if you read through the last analysis and you look at the K-pi scattering and on the analysis of the inelastic part, they come up with uh, the suffering from ambiguities, um, which they could only reveal if they had additional channels. Can you close this hole? You mean can we can we measure k pi pi or something like that? Well, you have to, you're in the you're in the uh, uh, in the non-elastic region. Yeah, and it so, will. Uh, and so. No. Mm. There are the uh, last analysis claims they had a couple of ambiguities that couldn't resolve. Right, right. So we at, at these simulations we concentrated uh, on the elastic part below one one point two GV uh, in the mass of K pi, but we have also simulations uh, beyond that domain. Uh, so in principle we can. I raise questions about 1410, 1430, those higher states. Whether, you know, the question is whether if we have a scalar nonet in low ground state scalar nonet, whether there are another nonet of higher states. So, and also not only that, but also people ask me about, uh, like Maxim Polakov asked me about whether we can measure K pi pi, which will be Pentagon anomaly. Yes, we can do that. There's nothing uh, which prevents us to do that. Moreover, the first excited states, K star 892, is surprisingly has a lot of problems related to 892. For example, Veronique Bernard tried to uh, consolidate uh, the world data measurement of BUS, which is fixed in PDG, and she took K pi from LAS and try to see if, if it will be consistent with uh, uh, tau decay from Bell. It appeared not. The reason was that there was a shift in the mass and uh, so she did her own analysis and uh, extracted parameters of K, K star uh, because there, there is a F plus zero entering. So anyway, yes, the short answer is yes, we, we focused on kappa 
but it does not mean that uh, other well, things. Well, there was a particular statement in the last analysis that needed additional final state in order to resolve the intrinsic mathematical ambiguity in the, in the partial wave analysis. Um, okay, second question is uh, you referred to the copper uh, at the end. I think if we, you know you have to provide valuable data and the extraction one way or the other is, uh, is more job of the theorist. But of course you have um, uncertainties owing to the extrapolation to the pion pole. Uh, you refer to the last analysis that you do the same thing, but of course they could hide a little bit because their statistical accuracy was such that they could hide a little bit behind them um, for the systematics. Now you will have much more data and you cannot hide. So you will have to, uh, you have all the issues on the systematics to go to the pion pole and to extrapolate um, exchange contributions other than this one pion exchange. Absolutely, um, you're right, you're right. So you know, the ideal situation is when you have a lattice, when uh, T is very small beam, close to the pole, and you have very good resolution to do in masses uh, in 10 MeV or so, our statistics allows us to, uh, us to do exactly that. So at this moment, we concentrate it on, we just repeated what uh, to be comparable with the previous measurements. We integrate it below 0.2 GB in T, but it does not mean that our statistics is huge. So we can go down uh, 0 0.1, 0 0.006, something like that. And then also we can do approximation to the, I mean, to the pi on pole, which is not possible, of course, because it's on the left side of the axis. So I agree that we need more work to be done there. We need more simulations. We also need to, we also were, uh, it was noted to us that exchange uh, of, uh, let's say it was brought us by reader, not by reader, by referees, uh, Gluex measurement of gamma p going to pi minus delta plus plus, which ideally should have been uh, asymmetric at low t should have been equal to minus one, but it is not, which means that other uh, other channels are contributing. So those things need to be simulated, uh, and new models, uh, new channels may be added, and uh, additional work has to be done to match to the data, but until data do not exist, you cannot perform such an analysis. I think you, you need to develop together, maybe with JPAC and, and, and colleagues and associated members, a strategy on developing, uh, on addressing uh, systematic issues, which you might have in the extrapolation. Right. Uh, once you have the precision data, you can look at all sorts of strategies and ideas, which are not possible with the present data. And I think that is, a, that requires much closer work with JPAC, and you should take advantage of this and try to develop a strategy. Yes, yes, of course. We cannot do, do it ourselves. We need more input from peers. But, you know, we are quite optimistic because there are many people are willing to work on that. I think if proposal is approved, there will be huge, more enthusiastic efforts on on all these things which you mentioned. Thank you. Also, I should thank you because of, of the long list of questions which you addressed to us. It was very helpful. <laughs> Sorry. It, it was very <laughs> long, but it was very, very helpful. And all of us, we, we break our head and try to understand, and, and uh, I hope we answered your questions. Thank you. Okay. So well, then we have to look at the clock. Uh, do you have any further questions, Stefan? No, not at present. No. Then I would like to ask uh, Matthias uh, Perlkamp, if you have any questions, please ask them now. If there is time, I think I have two questions I would quickly please like to Please go ahead, ask. yes. Uh, Moskov, thanks for the presentation and thanks also for responding to uh, the request we made last year. And the two questions are you know, related to those. Um, if you could add a little more information at what level the Monte Carlo simulations were done uh, with sure. regards to the invariant mass resolution and the neutron background, but also the signal um, <clears throat> uh, simulations. Is this a full chain of uh, the 
the Carlo that exists already at BlueX uh, with Geon detector response and reconstruction? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Okay. We need full chain with Geon and with theory input and uh, reconstruction, everything. Full, full, full analysis. Okay, thanks. Then the next question is um, on the cost estimates. Um, and uh, it's it's sort of uh, motivated by seeing in uh, the technical uh, review from uh, JLab uh, this comment on the electron beam uh, that there may be a modification uh, necessary. Um, I think it seems to be connected uh, to reaching the beam spot size that's specified in the proposal. There was a cost of uh, $1.5 million uh, in addition to what you had in the proposal originally. So I, I think I would like to know at what level you have looked at risks and contingencies. Is this already a cost that uh, could be reported to a, a technical review at, at the DOE or does this still require further work? Uh, I agree that there are some uncertainties about the possibility of the beam raster and the spot size. Uh, there are different opinions and people are working on that. So it will be clarified. This 5 million probably uh, has a plus minus one or something like that. When I spoke to Bob McCune uh, about the this type of questions, he said it's not, it's not your primary task. And it, it will be uh, settled by, I mean, you know, lab has to take a part and right. we need some, you know, some efforts. I think, I believe even uh, this project is a is an extraordinary project according to my understanding. It will run for a couple of years and probably JLab will consider to appoint some project manager or something because users can, I mean, I cannot command in JLab, right? I mean, it's <laughs> it, it it is very uh, it requires a lot of efforts from many many different uh, groups, uh, target group and uh, uh, accelerator group, injector, and a lot of things. Okay, so this I think makes good sense to me. If this proposal is accepted based on the physics promise, uh, then it will be turned into a formal project and then uh, some systematic uh, effort in costing and uh, management structure uh, will right. be made right. by the lab. Right. Okay. Th those are my questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think we do have to move on. So I uh, would like to call on the next speaker. Um, so, Moskov, if you can unshare your screen again. The next speaker is Jan Bernauer, who will present the dark light proposal, and it is there already. Please, all right, Jan, so go you ahead. Can slides. Perfect. You can hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, all right. Then, uh, yeah, thank you, everybody, uh, for your attention. Um, I won't read the full title. The short version is they are measuring, uh, going to measure, or want to measure, search for a 17 MeV um, force carrier of a fist force in the beyond the standard model at the injector. And to motivate this a little bit, uh, we know that the standard model is just a sliver of what we know about, right? Uh, it can describe about 5% the visible matter, 5% of what we know is out there, and the rest is something else, and we don't know much about it. So the search for beyond the standard model physics has the problem that there's a really large phase space, even if you assume just simple models. And if you go to complex models, it's essentially infinite. So it will be really hard to find that stuff in this vast space. There are two approaches to handle this now. You can try to mount an experiment to cover a large area in that phase space. And many of the experiments looking for beyond the standard model physics do this. Or you can look at anomalies in the standard model where some things do not quite add up to what the standard model would describe and hope that they, maybe there you see some influence of new physics um, showing up. And the one I'm talking about here is this anomaly in beryllium and helium. Uh, others are, for example, G uh, muon minus two or uh, some people thought maybe in the proton charge radius puzzle. And we put this proposal in two years ago, and since then, 
um, this X17 got more traction. Uh, last year, you might remember, they came out with this helium result, and that really pushed a lot of media attention to it. So I have a couple of screenshots here just from articles at that time, and that really motivated us to come back and propose this again. Beryllium-8 is really special in some sense. It has two narrow, highly energetic states, which actually can decay in an electromagnetic mode to the ground state. So it can couple to the photon there and produce photons. So in that, beryllium has three decay modes. It can do hadronic decay, it can produce this photon, and this photon can also be virtual and you get an internal pair conversion where you produce an E plus R minus, uh, E minus pair. The atomic experiment was looking at these, um, they are detecting the angle between these pairs. Um, and if you do that, you expect from the standard model normally a continuous spectrum, right? It should be flat. That's here shown on the left. Uh, the black line essentially is that expectation. And you can see there are data points which are away from it. At a certain angle, you see this bump on it. And you can explain that uh, with an intermediate state which has actually mass. So if you assume something around 17, 17 MeV, you get that angle out just from the energies involved, you get that angle between them out. The problem with that is that uh, if you assume a simple model, that coupling strength you need for this is already ruled out by other experiments. Feng et al. then pointed out, well, if you tune the couplings, if you essentially produce something protophobic, you can actually evade all of these limits and you can explain it with this. So it, it would be a fifth force, something unknown, um, to explain that, but it would explain that very well. Since then, they measured a similar line in helium-4, and again, you get this uh, bump structure. It's now at a slightly different angle, so it's probably not an effect of the detector or anything like this. Um, and it can be, it's interestingly explained by the same mass particle. And actually, if you look at it more carefully, it's actually with a coupling which is compatible between the two. So that's quite interesting, I think. So why should you believe it? Well, the original fit was very good. It had uh, chi-square, uh, reduced chi-square of one, uh, essentially one. The significance was seven sigma or around seven sigma, and it's the same for helium. So it's it's quite a strong signal in that sense. It's a bump and not last bin effect where you have maybe some acceptance issues. They remeasured it with the new detector they built for helium-4, uh, which has different acceptance, bigger acceptance, and they say the, uh, they see the same thing. So it's not anything in the detector, I would say. The masses are compatible. Um, and there's actually another experiment which can be explained by something like this. The group at MIT looked uh, in for nonlinearities in isotope shifts. And they observed them. It's, it's published here in this archive paper. The problem is it's not a smoking gun. You can explain this uh, also with some higher order effects in the standard model. And that's unfortunately true for most of these nuclear experiments. There's always a way you can uh, look for higher order effects which might be able to explain it. So it would be really nice to have a clean channel where you don't have this problem of different interpretations. So why would you not believe it? Well, it's a little bit maybe strange to have this photophobic force. Right? You need that to evade the NA48-2 limits. But if you look at it, you need a reduction of or to about 8% between proton and neutron. And if you look at the set naught, that has a level of 7%. So it's something we know already in the standard model. And I don't think there's a good reason that uh, beyond the standard model physics should be simpler than what we see in the standard model. So that's maybe not the greatest argument, but it's a little bit less likely maybe than something else. And recently, um, there were two papers on the archive which explain at least the beryllium-8 in a different way. The third one, uh, the first one essentially assumes a hard gamma-gamma scattering process, uh, so light-by-light -light scattering or something like this, 
and they actually say that they will not say anything about uh, helium-4 in their paper. I'm not sure if this was a time issue or whether it doesn't explain it. It just does makes no statement to it. The second one, um, they have you have anomalous internal pair creation. Um, I have to say I did not fully understand the paper, but as far as I can get from it, it does not make prediction about the strengths, just points out a possible way to produce this. Again, nuclear physics is a little bit messy. It would be nice to have a clean channel. So how would we measure that at JLab? Well, we know that it couples to electrons, right? Otherwise, it could not be uh, produce that pair. So you could produce it via Bremsstrahlung, initially, uh, essentially via initial state radiation of, an, of the electron if you do electron something scattering. So you, you pick something where you can hit a lot of beam on, uh, for example, tantalum, uh, where the cross section is high. So you produce this X particle, which then decays in E minus E plus. And from that, you can directly see the irreducible background is if that X is actually a virtual photon, which then decays the same way. So it will be a bump hunt on that background. But we'll see that this is actually not the most problematic background. So it's a bump hunt. You, you measure the two, with two spectrometers. You measure uh, the E plus, E minus pair and coincidence. And if you think about the kinematics, uh, you can assume that the best cross-section you get if the particle takes away all of the energy of the electron so that the electron's uh, tantalum scattering essentially happens at Q square equals zero, then the cross-section is just enormously bigger than anything else. So that's the dominant way to produce this. And if you have uh, some limits in your acceptance and it's the same between the two spectrometers, it's easy to see that the symmetric angle is optimal from this perspective. Looking at backgrounds, actually you see that you have to modify this to get the best result. Because the main background is not the irreducible one. And the luminosities we are looking at, random coincidences actually dominate. And that's between uh, where you have an electron with the right energy because it's uh, scattered elastically, but is uh, with a radiative component. So it either loses a photon uh, before the scattering or after the scattering, dominant will be before the scattering, and then you are in the right energy window for that spectrometer. And the positrons from the irreducible background where the electron partner is actually not detected, right? So the phase space for that is much larger than detecting the pair of them. And if you combine them, you can get actually quite uh, large rates. You can optimize this somewhat by moving the electron arm more to more uh, to a larger angle, more backwards, so that the uh, radiative elastic electron rate just drops down, right? And that um, we optimized in that way. And it turns out uh, 45 MeV is kind of the sweet spot. You can go a little bit higher and a little bit lower, and it still works. If you go too high, the angles get too small, and you can't put the spectrometers anymore. If it's too low, uh, either you can't produce it anymore or it's just bad for the phase space, the angle opens up and you see less and your uh, figure of merit goes down. Um, with a 150 microamp beam and a thin target, we get about 0.3 inverse femtobarns per second. Uh, so that's quite a lot. So we can really probe uh, what we have to probe. Uh, with two spectrometers, not super large. I mean, they are not small but uh, in, in the acceptance, but it's, it's not uh, infeasible. Two degrees, plus minus two degrees, in plane acceptance, five degrees, out of plane acceptance, plus minus. You put the positron at 16 degrees and 28 MeV central momentum, and the electron spectrometer is more backwards at 33.5 and 15 MeV. Uh, if we look at the errors, the, the problem here is that the energy of these particles is quite low. So multiple scattering will be an, a problem. So essentially, you get two coordinates measured very well in the first detector in your focal plane. And you can now play with the magnetic field to say which dimensions these are, right? And then you get another one from the uh, out-of-plane angle, for example, or from the angle in the focal plane, and you can map that to something. And it turns out the best way we can do this is just to take a simple dipole spectrometer, which is where the dispersive direction is the out-of-plane direction, 
So the out of plane angle is what will be mapped to the angle in the focal plane. The position along that direction will be the momentum and the position in the other direction will be the scattering angle or the in-plane angle. If you do that, you get something around 200 kV with our projections, which are quite uh, uh, defensive. And we assumed actually 250 kV for the rest of the reach plots. Uh, I think we can do better, but it, we have to see, we did this with an ideal magnetic field. We are now working on a realistic magnetic field to see how much worse this would get. Um, hopefully not too much. And I, I believe it will be better than what we assumed. And if you do that, you can then do some simulations. So for example, here, these are the counting rates for a possible X signal, assuming different masses for that X and a coupling in the middle of the range. You can see this is essentially what X's, X masses we could probe somewhere between 15 and maybe 18. After that, it drops down uh, too much. Talking about the backgrounds a little bit more, so the irreducible background is only 55 hertz. So that's not much. But they produce actually 120 kilohertz of E plus signals in the spectrometers. And the electron sees about 6 megahertz of initial state radiation E minus uh, from E minus proton scattering. So the random coincidence rate is around 500 hertz. Uh, assuming that we can resolve each bunch of a 1.5 gigahertz bunch uh, frequency. So we need really good timing to get that down that low. We don't need it during uh, data taking. We could take a slightly higher rate and sort it out offline, but that's what we want to have in the end because that sets the figure of merit. That sets how sensitive you are, right? If you simulate this, you get something like this. So you see the random coincidence is about 10 times more than QD. So QD is multiplied up here by a factor of five and it's still only half. Nice thing about this, because you get so many random coincidences and they are the dominant ones, you can get an initially uh, infinite sample of that by just mixing events uh, between the two arms, right? This destroys all correlations. Um, and random coincidences have no correlation. So you can get perfect statistic on that and see if you are actually, your acceptance is completely flat and doesn't produce fake peaks. That will be a very uh, important systematic check. Other thing is, because we are dominated by that, our uh, uh, sensitivity, our f figure of merit essentially does not scale with the luminosity. So as long as the accidental background dominates the QD background, um, we can go up and down in the luminosity somewhat and not change our reach at all. You have so, five minutes left. Okay, now well, that should be fine. So the scale really is set by the bunch clock. That's why we would like to run at the maximum frequency and not at, at the normal frequency um, to get the best. You do that, you can simulate data, and here uh, are just two, uh, two pseudo data sets, uh, one with a signal, one, one without a signal, and then try your search algorithm. And you can see, okay, for the, the data set with the fake signal in, we find it, and for the other one, we don't, right? Because there's none. And from that, you can calculate a reach, and that's here the shaded area. So in 45 days of beam, uh, we would cover everything which is still open in the phase space for this particle. So the upper part is essentially ruled out by earlier measurements. The lower part is now much reduced by a new result from NA64. And now we really cover everything else which is left there. And we could really put this to a rest if we don't see anything or be very happy if we see something. The spectrometers uh, are designed with an idealized field um, just to see how it would look like and how big they would be. Uh, and we are now iterating on this to get the real field. Um, it would roughly look like this, or it's very close to what we have right now in the, uh, uh, in the cut. Uh, 50 centimeters away from the target, we would have roughly the magnet. Uh, focal plane will be equipped with three triple jumps and uh, accepting plus minus 20 
uh, percent uh, momentum, and we will trigger off a trigger out of scope. We have some experience building these. Um, Darklight 1B was an experiment actually run at the MIT HVRL, where we built two small spectrometers. They even had slightly lower energy, um, and it, we used them at a very messy beam. And you can see we did some things to reduce background. Uh, you can see here there's a, I don't know if you see my mouse, but at the end of the spectrometers, there's actually a window, a large window, where particles which have too high momentum can actually which are not bent up, right, can actually escape the spectrometer and don't hit some material to scatter back. So that will be something we will also use for this new design. So it's, it's really tabletop at this stage, right, at these energies. And this result, uh, or this, this experiment actually produced some nice results, which are now published in FISREFD. Uh, just recently went through. So that's one one shot of the data sets there, but there's there are more. The uh, GEMS follow a uh, turn design, somewhat modified, um, which makes the stretching easier and they are not glued together so it can be repaired. The readout is with APVs and MPD4s, the same as SBS is using or Prex. And the Camping Group actually has built eight of those uh, from MRI funding for, for Darklight. So these are available. Some of them are, I think, now in being, being repaired. Some of them are at JLab, and some of them are in Japan, if I'm not mistaken. But they are they are in existence and can be used. The trigger detectors, so that would be a scintillator hodoscope. Uh, we are planning for 10 segments per spectrometer. Um, we could increase this number a little bit, maybe, if you have to. We need timing better than 500 picoseconds or so. Um, well, that's actually not a big deal. Uh, or not not unsolved. Uh, for Muse, we built a beam hodoscope, so a hodoscope which actually sits in the beam, with two millimeter thick scintillators, uh, with a side PM double-sided readout, and they achieve below 100 picoseconds with these thin scintillators. They were tested up to eight millimeter wide, so ours would be a little bit wider, uh, but we could split them up and just gang the side PMs to have the channel count the same. We tested them up to 15 centimeters long um, with the same results. So we need 25 centimeters, so that should be fine too. And uh, we, we can lose a little bit of the resolution. If it's 200 instead of 100, I think we still would be very happy. That should not be a showstopper. Base requirements, uh, we would run at the injector. The beam comes here from the left, the normal goes around, and you see a part of the recirculating line. But it can also be um, diverged here or uh, ejected here into a beam dump. This is all existing beam line uh, for testing. And there is a large segment where there's enough space to mount a uh, target chamber and the two spectrometers um, inside. And there would be enough space still to get around everything. Different you drawing. Over, if you would like to go to the conclusions, please. OK, so this is. Um, 3D rendering just to see the size. And yeah, I think modifications to the beamline would be quite minimal. We could run at LERF, but not right now because it doesn't produce the energy. And with that, I'm done. Any questions? Thank you very much. I call on the first reader of the proposal for questions. Uh, that is Shu Fang Su, please. Shu Fang. Okay, thanks for the very nice presentation and especially, you know, the motivation part and also the details on the background part. That was very nice. So I do have a couple of questions. So the first will be how about the timeline goes? Because there will be a couple of other experiments which will probably probe the same region in the next year or two. So how how is the timeline of your experiment going to be like? Of course, I know it depends on whether this proposal actually being proved or not, but so, so, that. <laughs> yeah, so, so that is, so I think we can say if we would have funding today, we could probably run in nine months, right? Um, so that's, that's from our side. Of course, it's not clear how fast funding would appear. Uh, JLab or some people at JLab said something that maybe they can help a little bit, or if we have to wait for DOE, it will take longer. Um, so this is a slightly older slide, but the numbers are updated. Um, of course, for most of these experiments, it's not clear 
how COVID affected them. So all of these timelines are pre-COVID. Uh, Mu 3E might cover it. Uh, they commission next year. So I don't think they will take any relevant data until 2022. Um, MESA should be able to cover it. Um, I know that the reach plot did not take into account the random coincidences. And you have seen they, they are run at similar luminosities, so they will have a similar problem. Um, and I think this will reduce their reach quite a lot. Um, and this will run post-2020, right? Um, that detector still has to, or that, that accelerator still has to be built. Um, for Web3, I have no idea. Um, it's not clear if this is going forward at all or not. Um, for LHCB, they probably cover that range, but it's not clear um, if the protophobic force would evade their limits. I think that's still a little bit up in the air. Um, it's from the interpretation, I think it's a little bit more complicated there. And that's as far as I know everybody who's looking at that. Okay, great, thanks. And uh, my second question is about the background. So in the in the current proposal, you put in the appendix, you put some uh, analysis for the background over there. But I'm thinking given the coincidence is the dominant background, uh, and uh, a Monte Carlo simulation, you know, with a detailed collider simulation is uh, not collider, sorry, <laughs> from the collider community with the detailed detector simulations is is probably needed. So can you say something along that direction? Because it seems like it's currently lacking in yeah. your proposal. So we, we believe that most background which comes from the outside can be shielded quite effectively because the energies are quite low. Um, so, so the most concerning part is stuff which comes essentially do, uh, through the throat of the spectrometer, right? Which photons scattering off of that. And there are some ways to mitigate that too. Um, we, we would need a little bit more information from JLab what the room background is to really say how much shielding we would need to reduce that to a, to a limit. And maybe some test measurements would be great there. Um, we are building right now the magnetic spectrometer field and a full CAT design with that, we can put that in Geant and then do a full simulation. Of course, it's a little bit of a, like a hand egg problem, right? We know that the scheduling of this experiment is, is complicated and without the signal maybe from the PAC that the physics is interesting and the signal from JLab that this has any chance of running anytime soon, it's it's hard to, to invest a lot of time and, and money in, in full simulations. Um, but it's it's planned and we are working on it. Unfortunately, uh, Chris Chalair passed away earlier this year and he was the lead on the magnetic design and uh, that um, really slowed us down. Uh, people had to, to see what was there and relearn and, and get back into it and this is now picking up. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so when he said in the when he answered my first question is about this nine month scheduling, and uh, if you know everything went smoothly, so this already taken into others into consideration, right? Sorry, I didn't get. Yeah, because, yeah. In my first question about you know the timeline for your for the experiment, and uh, you mentioned the time of like saying in principle it could be run in nine months yeah. if if everything went smoothly. So that has already taken into account the the all other things, you know, material yes. simulations and yeah. everything. Yeah. Right? yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. I see. Uh, thank you. I think I'm done with my questions. Mm. Thank you very much, Shufang. Then I call on the second reader uh, of the proposal uh, for questions. That's Concettina Sienti. Please, Concettina. Yeah. Uh, uh, do you hear me? Or um, yes, does can. it work? Yeah. Ah, very yes, nice. That, that is working. That's a miracle. Hi, Jan. Very nice talk. Thank you very much. I have just one, okay. one question because most part of the questions you have answered then per email. If I look at this plot which you are showing there, do I see that this Padme line which you have there, is it the final Padme? Is it the, the, the first running? Because actually they cover already the part where you have the G minus two band. And they I mean, are already taking data. So Yeah, I'm actually I'm actually not quite sure about that. I'm sorry. Um okay. Since, since, 
I think we had a why we are not super concerned about Podme, but uh, I'm I'm not sure. Maybe if Ross is online, maybe he remembers he he made that plot. Um, I think we looked into that. It, it might be that that they that changed, yeah. Because of all the of 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 all the other experiments which you have in this plot, I do see them as the major from what concerned timeliness, right? The major competitor yeah. uh, as as compared with all the others. So I thought you knew what was this projection. Okay, thank you. Anyone else who could uh, come to the help of Jan in this matter? If you're not a presenter and uh, have something to say, you can type it into the Q and A bo uh, box. Uh, Marcus, uh, maybe I can jump in. Please do. Okay, so so the G minus two, I think it's basically because there's a discrepancy between standard model prediction and the and the experiment from Blue Heaven. So that's why there's uh, there's some some uh, uh, beyond standard model explanation. One thing it will be like a unknown dark photon or whatever. Uh, you want a uh, gauge boson. So that's why they have a G minus uh, I mean, it, it's not an experiment, uh, actually, a search for that. Uh, uh, in addition, I, I do have a question, if I may ask, Mark. Please do. Yes, go ahead. It's, it's also concerned about the timeline. So you mentioned about this experiment can be started. Uh, in nine months, uh, so how long you, you think you will get a result? So we, we are asking for 45 pack days um, and 10 okay. days for preparation. Ideally, we would have the 10 days, um, well, we, we need them first and maybe have a little bit of break in between so that if we find anything, we can fix it. Right? That would be the, the commissioning time. Uh, we could run there mm -hmm. at a lower energy. We would essentially do elastic scattering of, of the tantalum and... and uh, I think the question was, once the experiment has been uh, finished, how long will you need to get physics results out? Oh, I, I think the analysis is pretty straightforward, right? It's a bump hunt. So I, I think that would be, I don't want to overpromise, but I think half a year or a year. I think that's... that's so that means your result would be 2020. 22, right? Sorry? Your result will came out at uh, 2022. If they run in 21. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think, I think so you list all other experiments. Let me just finish my question. You list all other experiments. Uh, they all like uh, independent search for this uh, 17 MUA. Do you know any other experiments actually try to uh, repeat Hungary experiment? I think there is an initiative at uh, Triumph trying to do something similar, but I have no details. And I'm if not they sure. do that, actually, they will be very fast, right? I, I don't know. Yeah, probably. Okay. No. And, and I don't know if they, if it's... I, 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 I ask this way right? because, uh, because I worry about, a little bit about the, if when you actually are doing the experiment, these things are already gone. Yeah, that's that's a risk. It's okay. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think we uh, should move on. Uh, thank the speaker for the presentation. And the last uh, presentation in this session is by Alexandre Deur, who will present the proposal on measuring the high energy contribution to the GDH sum rule. Please, it's your turn. All right. Uh, can you see my? Uh... My slides. You. Can you see my slide now? No. No. Okay. How about now? Now we can see the slide. Fine. Right. And go for the on the height button up to the top. Good. Thank you. You're all set. All right. All right. So. So, uh, good afternoon. So, uh, I'm going to present a proposal for measuring the high energy contribution to the GDH integral. So, the uh, spokesperson for the proposal are uh, Mark Dalton, myself, Justin Stevens, and uh, Simon Schirka. 
And uh, the proposal is for uh, running uh, all these. So it was uh, internally reviewed uh, and endorsed by the GLUEX collaboration, which means that uh, if the proposal is accepted, uh, then the, the GLUEX uh, collaboration will uh, support the installation, run, and the analysis of the experiment. The proposal grew out of uh, a letter of intent that was submitted to the PAC 47. And uh, um, given the, the fact that the, the PAC recognized the, the science case for such an experiment, they encouraged the development of the letter of intent into a full proposal. Likewise, the theory report uh, for PAC 48 concluded that the physics is important and the technical advisory committee saw no uh, special difficulty in running the experiment. So um, the GDH sum rule is a fundamental prediction uh, that link the um, difference between spin-dependent photoproduction cross-section integrated over um, the photon energy weighted by the photo in photon energy to the square of the anomalous magnetic moment of the object studied. And the validity of uh, this relation is mainly determined by the large uh, energy behavior of the cross-section difference. Uh, and since this uh, behavior is, uh, is ruled by the, the structure of the object that you're studying, if you're studying the GDH sum rule on the, on the nucleon, you're essentially studying the nucleon structure and, uh, and the NQCD. You can see that the, the knowledge of the uh, large energy behavior is critical for the, for the sum rule, yet uh, the data that uh, currently exist are only at uh, low energy. For the proton, uh, there's no data above 3 GeV, and for the neutron, there's no data above, above 1.8 GeV. So because of this, the behavior of polarized nucleon is unknown at large photon energy. It's expected to be described by the Regi theory, but uh, this is uh, yet to be verified. And in fact, um, the little photoproduction data and uh, the electroproduction data at large new and low Q square are, are in conflict with the expectation of the Regi theory, as I will show in the, this presentation. So, um, OLD with its uh, large energy byte tagger, its large solid angle detector, and its high photon flux is a uniquely suited place to study this type of uh, problematic. So the motivation for the proposal is, as I said, the large energy behavior of the integrant is critical for the, the sum rule, uh, but there's no large energy data. And it's instructive to look at the unpolarized version of the GDH integral, uh, which involves the sum of the, uh, the polarized cross-section rather than the difference, to see why uh, large energy measurements are important. You can see here uh, the measurement of the, the sum of the cross-section for the proton in black, and for the deuteron in, uh, in blue. And you can see that uh, if the measurement had been restricted to a, a few GeV, uh, there would have been no hint uh, that there's a, a problem with the, the convergence of the sum rule. The, the sum rule, the, the integral would have appeared to, to, to converge fine. But then if you extend your measurement to uh, 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 past 10, uh, 10 MeV, you can start to see that the, the convergence of the sum rule is uh, jeopardized is due to uh, the emergence of new phenomena at large energy. And in case of uh, uh, this uh, cross-section, that's the emergence of the uh, Pomeron exchange. So beside this, uh, it's also interesting to uh, make a measurement at large energy because the GDH sum rule was tested on the proton, uh, but the dominant uncertainty in this test is the assessment of what is the large energy uh, unmeasured contribution to the, to the sum rule. Um, so by uh, doing this measurement, we would uh, provide a much more accurate test of the GDH sum rule on the proton. And uh, for the neutron, there's no test possible yet because the, the maximum energy reached at present is not uh, large enough. And you can see that by looking at the, the running uh, GDH integral, which is uh, the, the GDH integral integrated up to a given new, and for the, the maximum value measured, 1.8 GeV, uh, you can see that the integral is uh, still undershooting significantly the GDH prediction. There's also a study or test of the GDH um, sum rule uh, from electroproduction data at very low Q square, uh, but you can see the overshoot uh, the, the prediction. At the moment, there's no reliable check available for the GDH sum rule on the neutron. So if we want to look at the large new behavior of the GDH integrant, we need to go back past the, the resonance uh, region. That's in order to perform a reliable uh, 
uh, fit of the data where there's no where the, the, the cross section is smooth. And you can see here uh, the world data on the proton on the left and neutron on the right. Uh, for the proton, uh, there's uh, a few points past the, the resonance region, and but for the neutron, there's uh, there's no point uh, past the, the resonance region. So there's very little lever arm for the proton to study the, the Reggie theory, and for the neutron, there's uh, no lever no lever arm at all. In fact, if you want to do a clean test of the uh, Reggie theory, you need to do an isospin uh, separation. Um, I'll show that in a, in a slide or two. Uh, but uh, such separation is not possible with the, the current data. And if you try to uh, fit the current data with uh, with Regi, you can see that uh, it's doing a fairly poor job uh, in black, for example, are the proton data and the, the plane line is the, the Regi fit. So um, um, to uh, to study the Regi uh, and high new behavior of, uh, of the integrant, we need to pass the resonance bumps that will allow us to uh, check for the first time uh, the Regi theory in the polarized uh, case, and it will also provide a reliable basis uh, to extrapolate uh, the data to uh, uh, infinite energy, where we can have the, um, the complete sum, uh, the complete integral. So with uh, its um, uh, 3 to 12 GV range, uh, all the, an experiment in all D would extend the, the coverage of uh, the proton data by a factor four and uh, by a factor seven for the neutron and the deuteron. This is the sensitive domain uh, for a sum rule violation, uh, but that's also the, the domain where the cross section is smooth and where a fits can be um, uh, made. Now, regardless to the interest of the GDH sum rule and its validity, uh, this is uh, an interesting domain to uh, explore on its own. Um, using dispersion theory, we can extract from the data the spin dependent Compton amplitude F2 uh, and uh, thereby test uh, chiral perturbation theory. Uh, another interesting um, fact is that uh, there's no non-zero signal uh, for deuteron in uh, the diffractive domain. Our experiment should be the first one to, uh, to see uh, a non-zero signal. Uh, as I mentioned, there's a discrepancy between Reggie expectation and the DIS data at low Q square. Uh, our experiment should, uh, should uh, clarify this question. Uh, the data at Q square equals zero can uh, be a baseline for uh, uh, the EIC diffractive study that uh, look at the transition between the IS and the diffractive regime. And finally, the data would uh, provide a useful constraint uh, on our knowledge of uh, hydrogen hyperfine splitting. But the experimental setup would, will be uh, as follow. We need to perform the experiment both on the proton and on the, the neutron uh, via uh, the turn target. Uh, this is for uh, uh, several reasons. The first one is uh, we need um, to do an isospin uh, study. And this is because uh, in the Regi theory, the isoscalar and the isovector contribution to the cross-section difference come from two different uh, meson family. The other reason why we would like to run uh, on the on the deuteron is because, as I mentioned, uh, so far there's a no non-zero uh, deuteron signal in, uh, measured in, uh, in the diffractive domain. And uh, as you saw also, the, the neutron data are uh, restricted to a fairly low uh, energy range. The energy coverage um, for the experiment would be uh, between 3 to 12 GV for the photon energy using the standard CBAS beam of uh, 12 GV. But it's also um, desirable to have a, a run at uh, covering a lower energy uh, range. Uh, and that would require CBAF uh, to run at, uh, at low energy as it has been done before, for example, during low energy summer runs. So there are three ingredients that are needed for uh, doing the experiment. First, we need a circularly polarized tagged photon beam. Uh, this can be obtained simply by using the uh, already existing polarized electron beam of CBAF uh, on one of the already existing amorphous radiators of uh, OLD. The second ingredient is we need the longitudinally polarized target. Uh, there's no such target yet, but we propose to, de to develop an OLD, but we propose to, de to develop a frost target um, for OLD. And the third ingredient is uh, we need a large solid angle detector, which already exists in, uh, in OLD. The experimental configuration and trigger would be um, the same as GLOX, and our signal would be very simple. We would simply uh, count every trigger and its associated tagged photon uh, doing the standard accidental coincidence subtraction. So our uh, analysis will proceed in uh, two steps. 
um, the first step would uh, test the convergence of the GDH integral, and for that, it's sufficient to just look at the yield difference. That is, uh, we can simply count uh, the number of events for a given photon helicity minus the number of events for the other photon helicity. Uh, there's uh, uh, two uh, great advantage uh, with uh, this, uh, this observable. The first one is that uh, the normalization factors are uh, not important. For example, if the cross-section difference follow this uh, regi form, then it's sufficient to obtain B without any need to uh, determine accurately A to test the GDH convergence. So the, um, the normalization factor, which uncertainty typically dominate experiments, are suppressed um, in, uh, in this observable. The other um, great advantage is that um, the unpolarized background are uh, exactly cancelled in the in, in the yield difference. And since uh, there's essentially only unpolarized background for, for this experiment, we have a, a signal-free uh, observable. So uh, with this consideration, um, we should be able to extract the KG intercept uh, at about 3% um, precision. The second objective of the, of the analysis would be to test the validity of the GDH sum rule, not just uh, check its convergence. For that, we need uh, to extract absolute, absolute cross-section, uh, and that will also enable us to uh, fulfill the other goal uh, of the proposal that I mentioned uh, earlier. So for absolute cross-section, we do need to uh, determine the normalization factor, but the unpolarized background still cancel exactly in the cross-section difference. So because uh, we, we need to determine this normalization factor, we uh, expect um, um, uh, an uncertainty on the, the second goal of uh, uh, the proposal to be at the level of about 5%. Per, 5%. So um, the time requested for the proposal is uh, as follows. For the 12 uh, GV run, uh, we would like to run 10 days on the, on the deuteron, a week on the proton with a few days of uh, various overhead. And then for the lower energy run, we would like to run about six days on the deuteron, four days on the proton with a couple of uh, days for uh, overhead. So with this uh, beam time and assuming the, the following uh, number, then uh, we have um, the expectation shown uh, on this slide for the proton on the left and neutron on the right. The red is the, the expectation um, from the, the, the high energy run at 12 GeV, and the blue is the expectation from the lower energy run. You can compare those um, pseudo data to uh, the, the, the world data that are shown in black. And you can see that uh, the statistical precision will be uh, greatly improved. The error bar uh, on each data point is uh, much smaller, and also the, the binning is much tighter. You can see also that the um, energy reach will be greatly extended. Um, the plot also shows the, the importance of uh, having a low energy run. For the proton, it will provide an overlap with the already existing data, but with a, a much uh, improved um, um, precision. And for the neutron, it would do the same, but in addition, it would fulfill a gap that would exist uh, if we run only uh, with the, the 12 GV um, energy. So here is the expectation on the deuteron, and you can see that uh, if uh, the cross-section follow a regi behavior, uh, we would see very clearly a non-zero uh, deuteron signal. So as I mentioned, the unpolarized background uh, cancel in the yield or cross-section difference. However, uh, this background may still affect the experiment by saturating the data acquisition. So we uh, simulated the experiment um, using Giant and uh, assuming uh, the total rate, a total rate of 80 kilohertz, which is the present uh, data acquisition capacity of uh, OLD, um, we find that uh, we would have a useful hadronic rate of uh, about 35 kilohertz which is what I used uh, for those expectations uh, that I just showed. I have five minutes left. Right. Um, <clears throat> so, and this number were confirmed with the real data from the GLOX run. So, uh, in contrast with the unpolarized background, polarized background would contribute to the uh, contaminate the signal, uh, but it turned out uh, those are very small. We simulated the beta Eichler uh, cross section difference using the same simulation. And uh, uh, we found out that um, the cross-section difference is uh, about uh, 0 0.01 microbarn to be compared with the five microbarn uh, expected for our uh, hadronic signal. So the, the 
the, the contamination would be at the sub percent level and there will be a no polarized um, background from the Compton reaction. So the impact of the experiment uh, would be the following by uh, measuring the high new the high energy behavior um, of the GDH integrant we will test the, the convergence of the GDH sum. Um, this is a, a fast and a robust analysis so it's a, a first step um, for, uh, for our analysis. Um, this would provide uh, the first measurement well outside uh, the resonance region uh, thereby providing a first clean test of regi theory uh, for the polarized case and if regi theory work uh, we would be able to uh, determine the, the regi intercept this level of precision, which is uh, an order of magnitude better than the, the currently existing data. This will be also uh, precise enough to resolve uh, the discrepancy between DIS data at low Q square and the Regi theory. Regi theory predict that the A1 intercept uh, should be negative, but all the DIS fit are uh, yielding a positive value for the intercept. Uh, the, if Regi theory work, it will also uh, enable us to uh, make a reliable assessment of the, the contribution, the sum rule uh, up to uh, infinite uh, energy. And uh, uh, if Regi theory worked, uh, we would also be the, uh, providing the first measurement of a non-zero polarized signal for the deuteron in the diffractive domain. The second part of the analysis uh, would involve obtaining the absolute um, cross section. And uh, this will allow us to improve the accuracy on uh, testing the GDH sum rule on the proton by 25%. We can make this improvement because the dominant uh, systematic error on this test comes from the, the assessment of the high energy part, uh, the, the GDH integral. It will also, also allow us to, uh, to make a first test of the neutron GDH sum rule. It will also uh, allow us to determine uh, the Compton amplitude F2. Uh, and that will allow us to test uh, chiral perturbation theory. It will improve the calculation of uh, atomic hyperfine splitting because we'll determine uh, the spin structure function G1 at Q square equals zero, and Q square equals zero is it essentially the, the Q square for uh, uh, atomic physics. And uh, also this determination of G1 um, at Q square equals zero uh, will be a base baseline for uh, EIC study of the transition between uh, DIS and diffractive regime. Finally, uh, once we install the polarized target uh, in OLD, there's a very rich program that will open. Uh, our experiment is uh, uh, simple, fast, and with a, a robust um, observable, so it makes sense to um, initiate such a program with uh, this type of experiment. So thank you. And uh, while I'm taking your question, I'm going to show this uh, one slide summary. Thank you very much. So uh, I call on the first reader of the proposal for questions. That is yes. Feng Gun. Please, Feng. Uh, oh, yeah. And then uh, I find that it's a very nice presentation. Thank you. Uh, first, I just want to comment. Uh, there's no uh, unpolarized uh, GDH summary. I mean, there's no unpolarized version for GDH summary. So, so, I mean, I know that cross section can be measured, and uh, this, uh, I mean, of course, this will be permanent exchange. You will, uh, definitely, the integral will not uh, will not converge, but that's not called the GDH sum rule. I mean, it's it's has nothing to do with GDH sum rule, as you also mentioned that uh, unpolarized cross section cancel. Out, so, so you shouldn't pause that uh, as a GDH sum rule. Really? Uh, it's clearly not the GDH sum rule, but um, I'm, I'm calling it the unpolarized equivalent of the GDH sum rule simply because. I understand, but but if you call that the GDH related, that's kind of uh, sometimes misleading or confusing. Uh, well, since you're already in on this slide, uh, you you mentioned about the rigid behavior for for this uh, polarized case. Um, do you have any expectation when this rigid behavior will will start to dominate or to show up? Any maybe some theory prediction? I'm kind of yeah. ignoring about this. Well, the, the the common wisdom is that it will start uh, somewhat above uh, two to two point five uh, GV, uh, but that's the one one of the the goal of the experiment to determine when the 
when the behavior is uh, is starting. So uh, there's a, the, the only from the polarized uh, from the polarized data, the only hint we have is uh, from the proton data, and uh, there's not much we can say. So uh, that would be determined uh, by the experiment. Okay, thank you. I think that's uh, more is uh, uh, more than that. Okay, so uh, one last question. Uh, you you say that the Q score equal zero. That's what you are going to do uh, the measurement right here, right? And uh, Q score equal zero will study the transition between DIS and diffractive regime. Uh, can you elaborate a little more? A little bit more. I I'm kind of confused about this statement. And so um, the 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 physics we are we are after here are the uh, the transition between the the DIS regime and the uh, and the Q square equals zero regime, and those are uh, different uh, type of reaction on the nucleon. Uh, the DIS regime is uh, 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 even by the um, single uh, the behavior of a single uh, quark, so it's an incoherent sum of uh, of uh, independent quark contribution. While the the, uh, the Q square equals zero uh, absorption involves the uh, the coherent reaction of all the quarks. So those are very um, th those are very different type of uh, of reaction, and uh, that's probably why using low Q square data uh, you 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 find something that is inconsistent with the the Regi, uh, expectation uh, at Q square equal zero uh, because you, you you have not yet transited uh, from the uh, incoherent sum of uh, quark response to a coherent sum of quark response. And um, so the, the statement is that uh, we should see this transition as we uh, transit from uh, uh, this uh, relatively high Q square data to a Q square equal zero. So, but, but, but your, your measurement or your experiment is basically well, Q square zero, right? Uh, the experiment will uh, simply provide the Q square equal zero baseline for this. There's, a, uh, there's of course a little bit of, of I mean, there's some data existing already from uh, uh, Slack and uh, and uh, and CERN, uh, but um, the 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 most interesting part would be to associate this data with the, the future EIC uh, polarized data that will be at uh, very low Q square. Uh, but by itself, the data. And this experiment will not be uh, able to to look at the transition because it's only only one uh, the, the, it's only at one one q square point which is q square equal zero. Okay. Okay. I I I I, I believe there's a little bit of, uh, uh, jumping too much because you you have uh, uh, q square equal zero DAS. And also, you mentioned about the diffracting, right? Mm -hmm. That uh, really depends on uh, how how region and the polymer actually works, right? So it's not clear for that. So I I I I, I treated this like a comment. So you know, think about. It. Okay, Marcos, I'm done with my questions. Thank you, Raj Feng. Then I call on the second reader. It's Mas uh Matthias Padekamp. Do you have any questions? Um, yes, I, I think I want to focus on uh, some experimental uh, questions. Thanks for the nice presentation, and I think this is interesting physics. I want to start with the DAC bandwidth. You told us uh, that uh, it's 80 kilohertz, and uh, you have looked at a scenario in your simulations where you uh, basically fill this up uh, if you combine uh, the hadronic final states with uh, backgrounds from uh, beta Heidler and uh, Compton scattering. Um, and so I, I wonder a little bit, uh, if you sit so close uh, to the bandwidth, what sort of rate-dependent uh, daytime effects uh, could you have? And uh, how could this depend on uh, helicity in uh, the, the beam? Um, is it wise to, I, I don't, don't know anything about the Gluex uh, duck. Uh, of course, if, if uh, the lifetime is constant, um, 
at, at all rates and then it uh, is a step function dropping off at 80 kilohertz, there's no problem. But otherwise, I think there could be systematic effects. Well, and, uh, you know, the, so first, this um, 80 kilohertz, um, that's just to, um, um, to, say, to, to use the, the number, we, we hope uh, that uh, the, the DAC performance might improve by the time we, uh, we run the experiment. Um, regarding the, so we could choose, let's say, if if the the, the the limitation improved, we could, you know, choose to stay at 80 kilohertz, and if it doesn't, we could choose to to run at 75 uh, kilohertz if we uh, if we we fear that uh, this could be a problem. Uh, but uh, there's uh, there's typically no. Um, we, there's typically no dead, dead time um, associate. Um, I'm sorry, uh, elastic related dead time uh, in our data acquisition system because we're of course very uh, wary about it. The the fact that the rates are different from uh, for one ACT and another ACT, uh, the, the rates are uh, the, the asymmetry is very small, so uh, this is a, a very tiny effect uh, that is negligible, and um, for the rest. Uh, we have run experiment at GLab uh, at the limit of the data acquisition uh, using uh, doing doubly polarized uh, experiment. And uh, of course, we check uh, if we have elicity, uh, elicity dependent date time, uh, but uh, typically we don't see those. But okay, this thank is you. something we check during the, during the run to make sure that uh, this is not occurring. There's no effect. Uh, thanks. I want to follow up uh, on one thing you said about the possible duck upgrades. I noticed in the proposal this gets discussed in some other context in the uh, target. Uh, I think there's a thermal barrier resistance of the beads uh, that uh, leads to a high temperature in the target material uh, as compared to what the dilution refrigerator can do in the uh, helium-4, helium-3 uh, mixture. And one comment you make there is uh, that if one uh, could introduce a stronger holding field. Um, you know, one could uh, then take advantage of uh, an increased uh, bandwidth. So one could go to lower temperatures and the uh, beam heating, I understand, could be higher. Uh, is this something that's concretely planned and would this add to the cost very significantly? Uh, no, it's it's just to, to give some, uh, you know, some, some possibility. The, uh, or, or the, the the prospect of improvement, but uh, we are not planning to uh, to uh, to run in this mode. Uh, I think we wanted to, uh, to 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 show the the various possibilities for the 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 frost target in OLD and uh, what would be the its uh, uh, type of performance it can reach. But we don't we don't need to uh, we don't need this type of uh, of, of performance to, to already uh, gather enough statistics, so there's no need uh, to go into this complication. But I think it's, it's nice to show that uh, there's potential to this target. Okay, so it's along the lines of demonstrating that the frozen target could be used for other That's right. future ideas. That, that's correct, yes. And then I, the last question, I think also experimental, is on the combined uh, trigger tagging efficiency. There I noticed that um, the plot that you have uh, in the proposal and maybe also in the slides is the combined efficiency versus new. Um, and uh, they have very small errors and then this big jumps, uh, first of all, from bin to bin. Uh, first of all, I don't know if this is data or Monte Carlo. Um, and uh, if it's Monte Carlo, uh, do the data show the same behavior? Uh, yes. Uh, and uh, the reason. Um, so we should. The, the reason we have uh, this jump is that is um, is uh, just um, depending on the, the efficiency of the, the various phototubes. Um, um, but this this will be measured uh, by what we called uh, total absorption counter runs, um, and uh, that's that's what we see in uh, in GLUEX. So uh, this is very well controlled. And uh, we'll have dedicated measurement to. Uh... So for a certain beam energy, what I basically see in the plot is the granularity of the tagger. Uh, that's right. So um, what's happening is that uh, at the lowest energy, uh, there was no plan to uh, 
to really cover the, the, the whole uh, range of photon energy, only to sample it. It's why the, the efficiency is uh, about 50%. Uh, if everything is perfect, it should be 50%, but of course it's a little lower because of the efficiency, okay. efficiency of, the, of the, the device itself. But that's simply a, a geometric feature of uh, not not uh, be um, covering the the yeah. geometric space. Okay, thanks. Actually, uh, there's one small additional question I uh, that crosses my mind as we speak. Uh, you mentioned the proposal that the same measurement I think was approved at Slack E159. That's right. Yes. How how what was their projected uh, precision? I, I not that it really matters, but I'm just curious for reference. Uh, that's a good question. I've, I've, uh, I don't have the number uh, on my mind. The, the proposal was the, the physics of the proposal was the same. The the, the method was very different, uh, and the energy coverage was also very different. Uh, the slack energy much higher. Um, so I. I I don't have the number uh, in my mind, but it would not be directly comparable because um, yeah, the, the energy, I, I would suspect the, the statistical accuracy would not be as good. But on the other hand, the advantage would, would have been that the, uh, the energy range uh, would, would have been higher. Be wider. Uh, OK. Uh, thanks. Those were my questions. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, with this, uh, we close the open session for today. I hear you back tomorrow, everyone. And the PAC now reconvenes in the uh, executive session. Goodbye.